So hello everyone and welcome to the third and last event of this second full series of events organized by Functional Fest. We are a group of Italian developers in love with functional programming. We wanted initially to organize a conference uh, about functional programming to gather all the different souls and communities which gravitate around functional programming, both in Italy and abroad. But then coronavirus came and so we decided to organize a series of online events instead. And so here we are. So we already organized quite some events. You can find the previous ones on our YouTube channel. If you want to keep in touch with us and see what will be coming next, next year, you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, our account is at FunctionalFest. You can subscribe to our channel on YouTube, or you can just check our website at www.functionalfest.it. Before introducing uh, the speaker of tonight, I'd like to thank Double Loop for their technical support and the infrastructure they provide. And so I'd like to introduce you to Dmitry Kovainikov, uh, which is our speaker tonight. He is the co created Kovainik, which is a uh, a powerful duo of Haskell open source contents. Uh, they create a lot of open source software libraries. They write tutorials and they mentor people. Uh, well, Dimitri also just published his first EP. And just another great thing, he will teach a free course uh, about Haskell online for beginners in January. So if you're interested about that, uh make sure to subscribe tonight we'll speak about haskell architecture is just a piece of, a piece of cake introducing kix layer uh, an haskell framework for writing backend of web applications so remember if you have any question just ask it on the youtube chat and at the end of the talk we will relay the question to dimitri so dimitri thanks a lot for being here and the stage is all yours Thank you, Marco, for such a lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, let's start. Second. So hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk about Cakeslayer, which is an approach to backend of Haskell applications. And uh, Haskell already has several approaches, and you might be overloaded already by a number of choices. So I want to give uh, one approach and say how it makes your life simpler. So uh, you should be able to start writing your web applications with Haskell uh, quicker. Marco already gave a wonderful introduction, but just a uh, quick few words about uh, me. I'm currently working as a software developer standard chartered bank. I have five years experience in total using Haskell in production. And before I was teaching Haskell at the university, and uh, I want to mention that all views expressed in my talk are my own and not that of my employer. Let's go. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to speak what is a backend architecture, why, is, why you need to care about this, and why you actually need it. So how actually Cakes layer architecture was created, and then I'll give some high-level concept overviews of cake layer and we go into implementation details in Haskell. So the presentation will contain a few code samples in Haskell, but I will try to explain them. And, uh, but I must say it can be a little bit intermediate sometimes. So let's start. First of all, what is backend architecture? Why we need it and uh, why we should care? First of all, when I say the backend of a web application, what do I mean? I'm, and what does the backend do? So first it talks to front end. So the existence of backend applies existence of front end. It should be, there should be some web application or mobile application that uh, it takes user input and then it uh, transfers it to backend, which then analyze it. And uh, this is uh, one of the main role why you need backend. A uh, backend uses some serialization protocols to talk to the front end. It can be a human readable protocol, JSON, or binary protocol like protocol buffers. Uh, usually, backends have persistent storage in the form of some SQL database. 
And uh, not always, some backends can be stateless, but uh, most common ways they have some storage and they need to communicate it, like do some queries or some updates. Um, often backends do authorization and notification. They have this concept of users and they don't show all the content inside to, to all the users who use the front end. And uh, even for those who use, you, different users can see different things. So this is something the backend needs to take responsibility of. And it also does some background jobs. For example, once in a while, you see your users and you send the notifications, like emails or something like that. So not necessarily as an action, as a response to some user action, but from time to time you do. So this is what I understand by a backend of a web application. So you can see that it actually contains not only code, Sure, we write Haskell programs and we compose functions, we write types and we actually write code. But actually, when you like want to create a new application, you need to think not only about the code, but also uh, about other things. And for example, how do you test your application and how much can you test automatically? Because uh, sure, you write your programs in Haskell, which means that you already have some compile time guarantees from the type system and how you write your code. So you don't need to test that much, but you still need to test. And you, in your tests, you want to make sure that your code actually does what you want and not what you wrote. So this is important you need to test. Uh, also, you need to measure performance somehow. Haskell is a really performant language. If you don't uh, use like common pitfalls, it can produce actually quite reasonable performance out of the box. But still, if you are planning to scale, to have more and more users, at some point you might not handle the load and you need to measure performance. And uh, what people sometimes forget that adding the performance metrics and analyzation, it can actually slightly decrease the performance if itself. So if you already can't load, uh, can handle the load, and then you add a bit of extra on top of that, uh, you will get some probably some problems in the beginning. And uh, then you deploy your application, you need to configure. And so, for example, what do you do? Do you use your configuration of file or do you like um, use environment variables or some CLI arguments? How do you, do you deploy a binary or Docker image? Or do, how do you use your database? This also influences how you um, write your code. And when something, uh, goes wrong, you need to investigate errors. Sure, if it compiles, it works, but uh, no, not always. And sometimes errors happen and uh, you want to understand like well, why it's happened because you want to fix it. Usually you want to fix errors. And um, you don't want to read through thousands of JSON logs. And even if it's a single message, you want to understand where the error is happening. So this is important to think about. And also your API, your backend might evolve. So if you have multiple clients and they can, some of them can use old versions of front end, which don't support some features, you need to now stop, start caring about multiple versions. So how do you do API version or your protocols or database migrations? And also one thing, how do you actually keep data private and secure? So what do you store? What do you log to not have some data leak? Because uh, like data leaks very often and it's very, uh, unpleasant when this happens. So these are the things that you need to care uh, in advance because Haskell is uh, famous for having like super refactoring capabilities and you can change things. But even like in Haskell, changing the entire architecture of your problem is a bit of difficult. I was involved in several process of moving from one architecture to another and it's actually a lot of work and it's uh, changes a lot in the code and it's blocked by other people when you work in the same repository multiple, so a lot of conflicts. So it's still really difficult. And if you think about this in advance, you can prevent lots of errors. But there are also non-technical problems that you should think about. For example, how quickly new developers can become productive with your code base. So do you use something rare, something new, or do you use something more common, more popular and standard? How much time do they need to spend before they can actually solve the features? And can you actually hire junior developers? Do you use some fancy features which require some deep understanding that only seniors and experts can work? Or actually you can hire junior developers and can they know on, for example, basic Haskell knowledge and they can start program 
uh, in your code base right now. So this is important to think about. Uh, also, are you assuming that uh, you only can fire full stack developers, people who can also update uh, front end and mobile application and back end? Or do you have independent teams like experts on the front end language on, on the back end? Also documentation, because uh, people leave, new people join, and if this knowledge is only in your head and um, not written somewhere, you lose this knowledge and you can be productive, you can solve features, you will spend more time doing job that you already did. So documenting what you did actually solves some problems. So this uh, is all the part, the architecture, and all the parts of the things that you need to care about when you write back an application. So, um, before we dive into cake slayer, let's uh, uh, explore a little bit of history behind it. So as I mentioned in the beginning, Haskell already has lots of approaches um, to structuring your application. They have different trade-offs, they solve different problems in different ways, and it, uh, not, it's not always clear uh, which one to choose, but you need to choose something, you need to start somewhere. And uh, well, we wanted when we were to start like first web application properly, we wanted to use like the best option. For example, we want to see what options already exist. We want to choose uh, the best one, which solves all of the problems and doesn't have, uh, doesn't bring new problems. Or we maybe even want to create uh, immediately a new better approach. So for example, we see all this done and just create the better things. But in practice, it didn't happen like that. So it was a slow process of trial and error of improving, of evolving and adapting some of the solutions. So you try some things and you see that they don't work. And uh, some things actually require time to see that they don't work. You don't immediately see. So you do this approach for a while and you add more and more tests. But then, for example, tests are slow and they don't work. So you they don't actually test things. So you see, okay, so in retrospective, this approach probably was not that good. And yeah, this thing uh, takes time, but once you have this experience, you can make the correct choices, but coming up with a architecture, some solution, it takes time. So our first solution was a template project we created in uh, my previous job. This is three layer repository based on the three layer architecture. And this is already a template project for a backend application of Haskell. It contains all the configured stuff, the database, and notification, and the other. And uh, when we created a new project, we just uh, copied this template to a new project and changed like, some standard names, some application name, and some stops. We had even a CLI scaffolding tool to copy this project and change the strings. This is how we did. And it worked for a while, but it wasn't optimal approach because as I said, you realize with time that some things uh, needs require improvements. And uh, uh, like you change it in one project we are actively currently working at. And uh, then you realize that well, it actually would be good to change this template as well, because next time when we copy, we need to fix it again, like maybe just fix one template, but you already have some other projects and you need to go to them and fix these problems. So it uh, required more time to maintain this approach, even though it actually really uh, worked and really helped us. So after this, uh, using this approach for a while, we uh, realized that there is a uh, actually possible to move all these common parts into separate frameworks. So you can think of framework as a big library with lots of opinionated choices, uh, which also helps you to be more efficient. And this is a cake slayer a framework. And moreover, it's on GitHub, it's open source in Kovainik, you can see and check it out. Moreover, there is a project template, a piece of cake slayer, also open source, you can go and see how to actually write a backend. There's already a working backend with all the things configured using this framework. This uh, example in framework was created by uh, Veronica and uh, I, and uh, it's battle tested. So it's not uh, really new. It's been here for three years and it's been used in at least uh, seven projects. So it's, uh, and it actually works been used quite successfully, I must say. So uh, there's some history and uh, I would like to share uh, what problems it solves and how it does it. 
So let's now talk about some high level concepts, some principles behind Cake Slayer. First, we have some goals in this project. We want to solve a specific problem, a backend web application, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. So this is not a framework for writing a compiler or CLI tool. It uh, doesn't work for that, just only for this specific problem. And we don't try to be as abstract as possible. So we don't have like lots of pluggable holes that you can choose. We do a lot of choices for you and they have some abstractions, but we don't allow to, to change every possible part. Um, if you want to do this flexibility, if not all parts work for you, you probably uh, don't need cakes there. And again, we also don't try to solve all the problems uh, uh, possible. So we don't want to like uh, be, like, I don't know, super efficient performant. We do uh, want to uh, like optimize some trust. We don't do obviously slow things, but we like not saying that this is the ultimate solution. If it works for you, it's great. And it worked for us multiple times, but if it doesn't, it's also not a problem. But we still want to offer a reusable interface. So kind of like uh, don't want to be specific to one particular applications because backend, uh, backends of different apps, they have some similarities, but they also have different parts. So if you just <laughs> don't want to copy one application and ship it, uh, we want to offer some reusable interface. Uh, we want to use battle tested libraries. So because um, if something uh, is really new and experimental, you might not be able to find resources, but this is battle tested. It has fewer errors, um, it's more robust usually, and uh, it's uh, easier to provide this reliability interface. And we also want to support monolithic architecture. So this is not a framework for microservices, it's for monolithic apps. So um, coming from these goals, What's difficult usually in Haskell when you uh, write like new codes, new applications, new libraries, is that you're overwhelmed by the number of choices, like number of libraries and approaches, and uh, they're all good. Usually they have high quality, like Haskell libraries, but it's not clear usually which one to choose. So there is no clear guidance or comparison. And if you want to start, you need to do like really lots of choices. And uh, in Cake Slayer, we do these choices for you. So you don't need to think about these things. You can just, okay, uh, take this um, stack and start solving problems immediately. So be productive. If you realize that something doesn't work, you can change maybe your parts to improve things and not use everything that doesn't work for you. But at least you can start quickly. So if you don't have lots of uh, choices, you can focus on other things you don't need to do. You need to spend your energy uh, choosing these things. But if you actually have a lot of choices, it's like constraining your time. And uh, speaking about things we choose for you, so we choose the stack. The backend is in Haskell. Obviously, you can change the language because the framework itself is written in Haskell. And it's for REST API services. So if it was something like GraphQL, maybe it was a different framework, but we support REST API. The, uh, Framework assumes that front end is written in Elm, and specifically the communication with Elm front end, uh, web I mean web front end is in, done in JSON. Elm has binary serialization, but we do JSON. And in theory, you can do still use Cake Slayer and write front end in something like a pure script or TypeScript. You will have just um, things in the framework that you don't need. But if you're writing like a backend of application, you probably already compiling the entire universe. So um, having extra few defenders is not a problem. And uh, the database is PostgreSQL. Um, it's uh, also hard coded, hard -coded in the framework. Uh, in theory, it's possible to make it uh, like uh, switchable to some other SQL libraries like MySQL or SQLite because there is this uh, family of simple libraries that have kind of like similar concept. So it's here it's possible to uh, also allow this choice for users, not constrained to PostgreSQL. That just hasn't been done yet. Just uh, always use PostgreSQL. 
And for mobile application, we usually write in Dart Flutter and we use protocol buffers protocol to, it's a binary protocol to communicate with mobile application. There is also a nice cask library for that. So you can see that the stack is optimized for productivity and efficiency and we do some choices for you. And now to the Haskell part is that we also do choice of libraries for you. So this is the dependencies of a cake layer. And it comes with these libraries. For example, as I said, we use a PostgreSQL for database and it specifically use a family of PostgreSQL simple libraries. Which, uh, I mean, PostgreSQL simple named and PostgreSQL simple migration to do database migrations. So in these libraries, you write row SQL queries, as strings, or like uh, using the quasi quarter to don't do like uh, quotes and other escaping symbols. And the not, we don't use ORMs or EDSLs. And I'm not saying that uh, uh, row scale is uh, better than the they both approaches have their own benefits and drawbacks uh, just for to align with our goals we've chosen this approach and uh, limitations of this approach doesn't uh, uh, contradict doesn't like uh, stop us from achieving other goals so it's a nice choice and we also it's like simple approach people don't need to uh, learn new Haskell libraries because Haskell has lots of uh, SQL libraries also lots of either cells and different. So coming from one company to another, you might have a, a huge chance that you will need to probably learn another library. But if you know a scale, you can switch from one project to another easily. And for web applications, with its fine REST API, we use uh, Servant. And you may think it's contradiction here. So we like we can uh, use simple library to write, write raw scale libraries for databases. But then on the API, we use quite difficult, complicated uh, type level library. But the benefits of Servant are so good that it's quite hard to give up on them. So it's it's a type level library, but the DSL is not that uh, difficult if you don't uh, do like very custom and uh, uh, not supposed stuff. So we have some endpoints usually of uniform shapes, and we did some. Uh, we solve, we need to solve some problems when, for example, we introduced authentication. Uh, but uh, once the choices are done and, and uh, written, you also you all, all just need to implement uh, simple endpoints. And we even wrote a documentation, a step-by-step -step guide, how to add a new endpoint. So you can follow it and uh, add. And this, so this problem of complexity can be solved with documentation. And Servant has actually quite a lot of unique benefits. For example, you can generate automatically Swagger documentation from your types. You just have a description of your API and you get a description of, of documentation. It's really nice. And you also write the API and you, you get the functions and types of functions reflect the shape of APIs. For example, in the type, you see that this or argument is optional. So it takes maybe, and this is not optional. You actually have the correct type. So it's quite nice. Uh, for JSON, we personally use ASIN, it's the most popular library for protocol buffers. We use the ProtoLens library by Google. For Elm and Turop, we use the Elm Street library. We also wrote it and it's also open sourced. This library allows to generate Haskell, uh, oh, sorry, Elm data types and JSON decoders and encoders in Elm from the Haskell data types. So in our case, Haskell data types are kind of source of truth and we generate uh, schemas from generate the types and other uh, platforms from them. We use JWT for sessions and uh, notification authorization. We use uh, bcrypt for password hashing. It's uh, well known that you don't store password in database and you need, you need if you want to store, you store hashes. And bcrypt is kind of like standard solution for this. We use EKG in Prometheus client for monitoring and performance. We use Capitas for jobs and for supervision, supervision trees. We use a real standard library to like make our lives easier and uh, have some more utilities and we use call log for login. So this is a stack of libraries that we've chosen for uh, this approach. And let me explain it a bit more why we chosen this particular library. So maybe some of them. And uh, there are different libraries and different benefits, as I said, with different trade offs But so you think you're kind of like, uh, when you choose library, you are usually focused on some like technical aspects. So, okay, what this library problem solves, how fast it is, uh, how it provides errors and uh, stuff like that. But 
when you evaluate such libraries and do the comparisons, sometimes you forget about some things. For example, that uh, software engineers, they use Google search. So some problems, you just want to solve them quickly or you don't know how to solve them and you just um, Google them and hope to find uh, an answer. And if library is uh, mature, if it's old enough, it's been here for a while and it has lots of users, there is higher chance, higher probability uh, that you will find an answer for this. So yeah, um, I had some problems that um, like when I was developing that I wasn't able to solve by myself. So it wasn't clear. This was some type level mystery happening and it wasn't clear what's going on. So because the library is new or the approach is unique, you just cannot Google it and can't possible. So it happens to all of us. And this means this is a cost that uh, you pay for using something maybe not that popular with not a lot of guidance. Um, so, and the following just like types when people used to say it doesn't always help. Also, if something is difficult to a junior developer, so it comes and it sees very like, difficult abstractions, it actually also difficult for an expert. So your ex years of experience can help you to understand things faster um, if you're a senior developer, but still if it's something more difficult, is something that brings more complexity, you still need to keep these things in mind every time, which means that you spend your like uh, mental capacity on this, on dealing with this complexity instead of solving problems. So um, you think that are actually um, beginner friendly and uh, understandable to everyone. And uh, sometimes some new approach uh, comes up and you can see like, it might be really good. And you can see from the description, like it even has comparisons as libraries. You can see that it's uh, like really good. It solves problems and it will be nice to bring this in our like stack in our project. But uh, again, when something is new, you don't know uh, when like uh, what problems it will have in the future or how stable it is. It might change and you will spend more time just uh, fighting your tools and do uh, we shouldn't spend time doing this technology should help us and not us should fight the technologies so this all the things we should keep in mind and some libraries the choice that uh helpful in this approach so uh this was about some high level concept some concepts behind the framework. And now let's dive into some implementation details in Haskell. So the framework contains uh, lots of stuff, lots of models. I uh, won't be able to cover all of them. Mostly just some interesting parts that you can see and maybe compare with other approaches to see what works for you and explain some choices in architecture. But you can check the code, it's extensively documented and see there are other stuff. So first of all, of all the Gex layer provides this new type application monad for you and uh, which you use in your application. And this is a new type. It's a wrapper around reader CIO. So in some sense, it's a, like a real pattern. And what it adds, it just adds a, a one phantom type parameter for errors. I will explain later in one of the following slides why we need this, but uh, uh, in, a, in simple words, it's just a reader CIO monad with environment and uh, derived and implements lots of instances. And uh, uh, when you use it in your application, you can use you can have just a type alias, and just specify all the parameters, or you can create a new type. Like now it's your application, and it's just a wrapper around the KX layer application with spe specialized error type. So it's your error in your application, your like huge sum type is errors, and your environment. So your environment of your particular application just specializes types, and you don't have this like three type parameters in your application. And you derive all the type classes as well. So this is a little bit of repetition, but I want to say that it's not a problem. Uh, so even if it's boilerplate, it's a manual boilerplate, it doesn't grow indefinitely once you develop your application. You need to pay this cost once and it's not big like what five lines of code so i see sometimes that haskell developers are really afraid of boilerplate like you should never write the same line of code twice and they can uh, sometimes use a very advanced language features to avoid doing boilerplate but uh, 
I won't say that it's but it's not that scary, especially when it's like manageable, when it doesn't grow and doesn't introduce a huge maintenance overhead. So, um, so speaking about environment of your application, this is how it could look like. This is just a record data type of all the data. It stores all the data and the login action. It's parameterized by the type of variable of kind from type to type. This is needed for log actions. So we use colloq login library and it's a uh, logger, it's logs messages in some monad M. So we just parameterize by this type variable and we later specialize this M to our application monad itself. So our, we actually can log in our monad. But besides that, just a standard environment that stores only data. So we don't store functions, we don't store implementations. Some there's only some data, some keys, some session parameters, maybe some data needed to function in your application. And uh, how we actually access the fields of this environment, we have this um, has type class, it's a common has pattern. It's a multi-parameter type class with two type variables field and environment. And it just uh, gets one method to get the field from environment. And uh, we have this helper function grab uh, that says, okay, if you are in the monad M that has access to some environment, and if this environment has this field, you can actually get this field in this monad. This is a helper function. It also will be used in one, some of the examples later. Uh, just get stuff out of the environment. And you can write a pretty straightforward instance of the has, for example, your environment, it has field key, and you say, okay, it has key from environment and the method uh, obtain it just uh, uh, same as nth key, alias to the record field. It just uh, like three lines of code, what for? Or you actually can use deriving uh, via to get the field. So you say deriving has key via field, and you say the name of the field in string and key and environment. So you can have like only one line per field to do all the stuff. So you just add one line when you add new field, and you get the access. So it's kind of like the abstracted resolution. Uh, the this uh, field. Uh, new type which is used for the rank is based on the has field uh, type class which is generated by jhc for you and uh, the limitation of this approach is that you can't have uh, like because of how the classes work you can't have two fields uh, uh, of the same type for example two fields of type key you need to have new types around them if you like if they're in the one shape so this is the uh, only limitation of this approach but in practice, it wasn't a problem. So we don't do unwrapping because the steps uh, a lot. So it's um, um, not that a problem. Okay, so we have this monad, we have this environment, we have this S pattern. So what we actually do with all of this and how we describe this is the main logic. For example, we have some interfaces or you can call them infects or monadic type classes or whatever name you like. And this, those interfaces, they offer some convenient functions and convenient methods. And uh, you model your requirements with these interfaces, and then you implement instances using this uh, has pattern. So to give one example, here's an example of type class monad SMS. So what we want, we want to send SMS messages to our users. And we have this like uh, one method send SMS. It takes a phone, phone recipient phone number. It takes a text like SMS body message and it doesn't return anything. So it's just a function that takes two uh, values and send an SMS. So we want to use this like nice interface to send phone messages. So uh, this type class doesn't have laws, but it's again, I'm saying it's not a problem. Uh, some people usually think that if type class doesn't have laws, it uh, must not exist. So it's a wrong abstraction. And I think uh, we, again, as a community, often scary about introducing interfaces and using type classes just for the sake of abstracting things. And not everything should be like some, um, uh, should have some um, mathematical notion of like lawfulness. And, uh, if, you, and if you don't have uh, laws, it doesn't mean that the abstraction is bad. I mean, it still can be useful, but uh, even if it has laws, it doesn't mean that it's good. So there are plenty of abstractions in Haskell that are lawful, they have laws, but still 
bad and uh, it's not convenient to use them. And it's not like a showstopper for not introducing abstraction. And you still can have a bad abstraction. So it's, it's a difficult like problem in general to come up with nice abstractions. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have our jobs. And um, it still can be bad. And with, with the more experience you get, the better things you create, and the more understand that some things might not work. So uh, yeah, this just shouldn't be a stopper. And this is the approach to the framework. Just create uh, interfaces for your new things. So how you actually implement instance of this interface. So instance always like three lines. You implement the, this method as an additional implementation function. So this implementation is moved into a separate, a separate function. This way you can actually uh, reuse it. If you have a very similar monad um, environment, you can reuse function easily. And um, uh, yeah, the instance itself becomes uh, very simple. And the function itself, so send SMS input implementation, is now written using this uh, has pattern. So when we now want to send an SMS, uh, we specify constraints. So we see that the, some, we work in some monad that has access to IO, like obviously. If you want to send SMS, we need to talk to real world, like literally talk to real world over the phone. And um, we have some monad reader that has access to environment, some monad that has access to some environment. It can be anything, but what's important is that this environment has should have this SMS key. So this is maybe some token that allow us to send um, SMS messages. Uh, if I recall correctly, we were using the Twilio platform. This is a nice platform that allows you to, say, to send uh, JSON payloads, and it will handle sending of SMS messages for you. So this requires some key. And all the rest of the methods uh, of this check of this uh, method. And here you see that we use this grab function to take the key from the environment. And we then have this low level implementation. So this can be implemented via some Haskell library that is more generic than um, you need, more, more flexible, and you just want to specify only some parts. Or if you just implement the uh, access to this API on your own, on yourself, it's like dirty implementation details. You don't want to have an our business logic and we just provide a nice interface around this. And uh, now when we actually use this function, so for example, we have this rest endpoint slash API slash SMS slash test. And uh, here in the set type signature, we specify, we don't have like any details, like does it have SMS key or what environments it have? And does it have access to IO? So this is like encapsulated inside the meta implementation. And here we only specify, okay, we have some monads that can send these messages. And in the body, we just say, send message to this phone with text uh, test message. This is a nice interface. And one thing um, I like this approach is that in the type signature, we see uh, what this function does. So I can say, okay, it sends this message and it does some login. So I know that it doesn't uh, talk to the database. Uh, I know that it doesn't do like maybe any uh, necessary networking or doesn't maybe throw errors, stuff like that. So we just um, handle this stuff and it's nice for documentation. One critique of this approach, like we specifying these constraints is that when you have like lots of functions, you need to repeat uh, all these uh, constraints for all your nested functions. And it might be like, again, it's a boilerplate and now it's unmanageable because for every new function you need, if you add new constraints somewhere deep, you need to propagate it up. It's not nice. But in our case, our functions, uh, they kind of like have the same shape as REST API. So we have one endpoint and this endpoint has one function. Usually we don't have lot of, lots of nestedness. The functions are kind of like reusing standard functions or they don't call other endpoints. So we don't repeat this in uh, constraints a lot. And this is nice. So not a problem for us. Okay, so we created all the system with all these effects and now, but now how we actually test the system. So once you uh, wrote it, we need to test. And for testing, we use a different monad, like test application. Uh, and we implement all the instances that we need for testing. And we either 
reuse them. So remember this impl functions, we can easy, easily implement instances in one line using these functions if they're the same, or we just mock or ignore the methods if they don't use. But we never mock SQL queries. So if we write some SQL, we actually want to test it, what we did. And since we write in row strings, we want to make sure that there are no syntax errors. So just simply running the query makes sure that it doesn't, at least it doesn't have uh, typos. And uh, the framework itself also has some testing utilities to work with these monads, which is nice. And which also kind of cute is that you can test some functions uh, using GHCI. So for example, when you send an SMS message, you probably don't want to do this in tests all of the time. Otherwise your business quickly will run out of money, but you still can do this in uh, like GHCI, just in three lines. You create environment, you just, uh, Mm, actually two lines just run this uh, function uh, with this environment and you can see on your phone immediately your SMS arrived so it's nice and in the code this testing done like this so here we want to, did, wasn't even bothering with uh, creating new type just alias to uh, to application monad from Kexler. And so for example, for monad cache, we reuse implementation, but for SMS messages, we don't do nothing. For example, we might have a function that uh, queries some users from database. It updates their statuses. It sends them SMS messages and email notifications about uh, this update, and then uh, it returns all the user. So we still might want to test uh, this function uh, but we don't want to send SMS messages. So we want to just provide unit tests. So, okay, given these users, we expect to have these updates, only these users changed, but we don't want SMS. So we just uh, don't use uh, SMS for the test. And that's all. So now, uh, how about exceptions? Well, another story because uh, we need to handle some errors and exceptions and Kexler offers uh, its own approach which contains several steps and I think it's a bit interesting. So I'll cover a little bit of it. But um, so what we want, we want to display errors on type level. So we want to have checked exceptions kind of documentation, but we still want to continue using reader T IO and monad and lift IO abstractions to have this access to all the ecosystems of asynchronous computations and other. But it's actually a contradiction and why? So let's prove, we have school developers like proof. So let's prove why well, it's not possible. So we want to display errors on type level and the most common approach is using monad error type class. I mean, there are other approaches if you Google, but we can assume that it's the only approach because it's the only approach that works. And using monad error uh, usually requires to have except C monad in your transformer stack, but except C doesn't have monad on lift or instance, which means that we can't do asynchronous computation. And if it's possible to implement, but it's like 30 hacks, it's a very evil instance. So it's a problem. But if we use just reader T IO, we, it doesn't implement mon, uh, monad error instance. So it doesn't uh, have checked exceptions. Rio implements only monad throw, which is unchecked exceptions. So we can't have them. So it's a problem. But in cakes layer, we actually can do both. So uh, it's not a difficult trick, but it took some time to implement. So initially our monad was reader T over except C because we valued the uh, having exceptions more, but uh, we started having problems with it and we came up with a solution. So what do we have? In the end, we have this data type in cakes layer called error resource. It's parameterized by the error type and it contains the call stack, call stack of the, all the functions. So you can have actually the position of code where this exception was thrown. And like actually the whole call stack, not actually some position, you can format it nicely. It becomes very handy when you want to understand which function fraud it. Then we have this type alias for monad error. So with error, it's error some your now error is replication error. And this is alias for monad error for error resource with this error and a has call stack. So in this type alias, we kind of like ship it together with has call stack. And when you specify with error in all your functions and all your nested functions, you always get this um, has uh, call stack constraint and it's nice because it's implicit parameters. You can uh, easily forget to specify it if you specify it manually and then you will lose your call stack. Actually, it's a problem. But if we bundle it as a part of other constraint and we make it uh, impossible or difficult to specify aliases and sites, for example, writing this error is much simpler than uh, like this part. 
which is encouraged. So you will get actually full stack. And uh, there's throw error function. Again, it doesn't take this uh, error resource. It takes just error and it uh, wraps it in error resource. And since we specified constraint with error, we have the access to call stack. So we just take it from the function, from this implicit parameter that was given to us implicitly. And we now uh, always throw errors with call stacks. And uh, just to remind that this is how our application monad uh, looked like. This is just three type parameters, error environment and a value just a wrapper over reader C. And it's actually possible to implement monad error instance for this because we can specify, okay, we throw error resource of type error as specified. And th this error uh, type variable is also repeated in the application monad. And internally, this instance just throws uh, exceptions via IO monad and catches also via IO. So we are using just JHC uh, runtime system. You can check the implementation in the cake slayer code, but it's uh, just uh, four lines of code. Mm. Nothing, but it's really convenient. And now we have checked exceptions. Moreover, we can go further and introduce polymorphic errors because, well, we have this, a okay, Kexler encourages to have this huge sum type, all the errors. But if you specify that all functions just throw this um, a huge error, you are not winning uh, a lot because, I mean, everything can throw anything. Um, doesn't really help us. Might as well just not specify constraint. But if we have this S type class that says, okay, we have this big sum S type, um, and we convert, can convert smaller error, errors from A to S, it's called S, and all we can match, we can probably extract from a bigger error sum, sum type. Well, now for lows lovers, this type class has actually lows. We can test it, and it's also not difficult to have these instances. And how actually the final uh, type signatures can look like? So for example, for this function, query name, which queries database, we can see from the constraint, okay, this is a sum monad M that throws some errors. And those errors can be like PG named errors. Okay, we know this, this only these types of errors. And it has some access to database. Okay, so probably this error somehow related. And for other results, some polymorphic. So we can actually see what errors is false. And again, it's useful for documentation. You not always have time to write all the error, all the like things that the functions can throw, or you can you can't write the functions, uh, the effects that functions use. But if you just see the type signature, you can quick kind of quickly understand what's going on. And it's not. And again, since we have like flex structure, we don't repeat this stuff often. And uh, one problem with this approach could be is that uh, it's not easy to like handle only one error, just fun some functions throw three exceptions, we catch only one of them, so we know that the result cannot throw the third, but uh, since again we have flat structure, we don't do this, we just want to specify these errors. And we have like this compile time guarantees now, so if we throw something that we haven't specified, the compiler will tell us, oh, no, you can't do this, or if you uh, specify that this function throws something, but it actually doesn't throw, the compiler will say, oh, this constraint actually redundant. This function doesn't throw this exception. So it's nice. And uh, when we throw errors, when we throw exceptions, we usually they uh, kind of coming from the uh, front end and we want to show a nice error message on the front end. So we convert all the errors finally to some pretty uh, error message, some set. Uh, type and we display it on the front end so we, people actually users know what's happening. So this is about errors, but uh, cake slayer actually has lots of other stuff. So it's, I'm just covered some uh, basic concepts, some of the ideas, how you write code generally, but it has like lots of helpful features to work with database, migrations, functions, testing framework, and uh, GWT notification, some password hashing functions, so you don't need to figure out the slow level details and uh, just lots of other stuff. Just uh, check it out. And to summarize, this is a framework for creating an application backend. So it's uh, big. It contains um, lots of utilities and it makes lots of choices for you. So you might feel that it's not flexible, but on the other hand, you don't need to think about all the stuff. You can be productive quickly, especially if this uh, framework uh, works for you. So we want to also be glue for existing Husky libraries. Instead of introducing lots of new common stuff, we want to combine like already written existing excellent libraries and uh, 
Husky libraries usually have great quality, but they don't always work well together. Sometimes they do, but not always. So we need this kind of like this layer, this uh, glue, and we do this in cakes layer. And we specialize for a specific tech stack, like languages and backends and databases. And we just try to combine existing best practices. And uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dimitri, for the nice talk. Uh, we actually have uh, uh, already a question from the audience, which uh, Ooh, nice. I can give it to you. Uh, so from Sekun, and the question is, does case layer uh, include a testing framework? Uh, it's not a separate testing framework. So our applications are tested with HSpec, uh, unit tests for unit testing, and with a uh, Hedgecock for property-based testing. So case layer have some utility functions like uh, to provide. So how you, it tells you how you actually need to pass environment, how you call this monad. So you can just use uh, wrappers around those functions to call call test your code nicely. Yeah. Okay, I, I should have missed it. Uh, do you recommend any other testing framework? Mm, I haven't used that many frameworks to be honest to recommend so i used hspec it's nice for unit testing it works um uh, simple and um i use hedgehog for property based testing and um not quick check i know that quick check is also really popular but uh, i know that hedgehog has quite nice uh, pretty printing out of the box so in some parts of the code it work i changed quick check to hedgehog immediately and i get the better output and i was able to see um like why my tests failing and quickly fix it and uh, the concept that um, things is just a uh, quick check is based on type classes and in this case i think that type classes not really working because you may have different genius for, for, for text you may generate it differently like with 10 characters only alpha of non numeric only like uh, digits only letters only capital letters something like that so kind of can't have this in single instance you have you need to have lots of new types so yeah, Hedgehog is nice, but um, um, I want you to use this a lot. Okay, thanks. Uh, the meanwhile, we have another question from the audience, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is, what's the reason why a backend framework like case layer specifies the front end part of the stack? So in this case, it's Helm. Yeah, so um, there are some specific parts that you need to do to work with the front end. So, for example, uh, Elm type system, it has um, like fewer features than Haskell. So, for example, if you specify type alias for a record, you cannot have like uh, self recursive data types because this type alias will expand uh, indefinitely. And uh, if you have some, some data types with uh, phantom type parameters, for example, one of them is ID. So we have in cake layer this uh, type ID, which is just wrapper over int integer, and it has a polymorph type variable. And um, to generate it with uh, like Elm Street, we need to have, uh, well, for example, to generate on the Elm side, you need to write some specific extra code. So we used one library that didn't handle this use case, and uh, it was awkward in some places. And then we like, wrote our own library. To make it efficient more for us and solve this problem so there are some some such things that you need always to do in your application when you want to work with front end so might as well just do this and uh, it you might actually realize after you do this that okay this is quite specific stuff you can do much more so you don't need to duplicate the stuff you can move this and uh, it becomes really nice because different front end uh, languages may impose different uh, like uh, constraints in your backend so, yeah. Okay, the answer is, yeah, I see this is because you auto-generate L types, okay. Yeah. Um, 
Paolo asks, uh, is this the famous tagless final? Actually, um, well, if you have an answer, uh, of course you can, you can uh, answer, but uh, I asked him to, uh, if he can elaborate a little bit the question because I didn't fully really get it, but of course, if mm. you... Well, um, I think the, the problem with uh, uh, tagless final is that in the community it doesn't have really strict definition. So it was introduced in uh, one paper by Oleg Kisilov and uh, it was used not how we like use it and understand it today. So it was used for like a, a strict interpretations like some generating AST trees and inter interpreting them kind of like, uh, as an AST or as a actually running functions. And uh, I mean, I don't see how it can like uh, uh, stop this approach from using two monads, so we can think of this. But uh, I would say you can think that uh, part of this architecture is tagless final, but not everything. So for example, specifying this constraint like monad SMSs, this is part is kind of like somewhat tagless final. Yeah. Thanks, great. Uh, well, we have uh, lots of questions tonight. Uh, so uh, next one is, what's the decision behind using help on Veraska front end like me, so? Uh, yeah, uh, the reason was simple. So when we use this, uh, like, right web applications, we want them to develop uh, with, uh, well, not develop, we want to make them available in regions with uh, low, uh, like, internet capabilities, like, uh, or like or smaller internet broadband, like, for example, in some, India regions. So in JSC, JS has uh, like huge runtime. And we, when we just decided the choice, we said, um, unfortunately, we can do because users won't be able. This was one of the reasons, just Elm runtime is much, much smaller. Even pure script runtime, I guess, I guess a little bit bigger. And also another reason with JS, uh, JS is that to use it, you actually need to do to use Nix for your deployment. So I. I uh, don't think there is a way to use JHCJS without Nix, and we didn't have Nix experts now, it seems, so it wasn't an option for us. Okay, thanks. So, uh, we have no further questions at the moment, and uh, since we are uh, online since one hour, I think uh, it's enough for tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Dmitri, for the nice talk. And um, uh, let me also thank Double Loop for uh, uh, technical support with the streaming uh, infrastructure. And uh, I also want to remind to uh, our audience that um, we can, you can uh, follow us on Twitter if you want to stay up to date with our uh, next talks and news, or just subscribe to our website www.functionalfest.com. Uh, this was the last talk of the year, so let's see you in 2022. And thanks, Dimitri, again. Thank you. See you. <laughs>